Hello! Today I'm going to respond to this video from Alpha Phoenix. I received a text message from my son who said, hey, you ought to watch this. So I did. And as I watched it, I made stops and I texted back to him what I thought the answers were. So let's take a look at the video and then we'll look at my responses and see what the video shows. The instant I connect this battery, the other end of the circuit is a meter away. Information traveling at the speed of light takes more than three nanoseconds to traverse this setup, which means that when I plug in this battery and the battery sort of asks the universe, you know, how many electrons should I pump into the black wire every second? It takes more than six nanoseconds for it to get a reply. So what do you think is gonna happen? Based on comments that I've gotten on other videos, here are four possible answers. Option A, the electric field has already solved the circuit. As soon as the battery is connected, the correct amount of current will flow through the connected branch and no current will flow down the disconnected branch. Option B, the electric field has already solved the circuit, but it still has to update information at the speed of light. So as soon as you connect the battery, the correct current starts to flow in the wires in a sort of bubble that expands from the connection point. Option C, the battery pumps an arbitrary amount of current into the wire, and despite one branch being disconnected, the current that's flowing splits when it gets to the fork and goes down both wires. Although this is initially wrong, it eventually stabilizes. Option D, Initially, nothing happens. The battery updates the electric field at the speed of light, and once information has returned from the other end of the circuit, the correct amount of current starts to flow in the connected leg all at once. In this video, we're actually going to be able to record a circuit like this fast enough to differentiate between these four options. So think about it for a minute, make your guess, and drop it in the comments while the title card plays. Okay, so I stopped the video at that point, and this is the response I wrote. I have just watched the first two minutes and 46 seconds. I think there will be current flow immediately due to the capacitive and inductive coupling between the wires. This will begin at the battery and will propagate out at approximately 50% of the speed of light, guessing that the velocity factor of a twisted pair is about 50. When the wave reaches either end, it will reflect back and bounce back and forth between the battery and the ends for a few cycles. After the waves settle down, the current in the closed loop will have settled to that predicted by Ohm's law. There will be an initial spike of current in the open loop due to the capacitive and inductive coupling, but this will settle to zero when the wave damps out. So, looking at the answers he had up there, I said that my answer was probably closest to D. If I show it in a more graphy view here, maybe some of these features get clearer. I really love this footage, and it shows that no, the battery has no idea how much current should flow when you plug it in. The battery is connected, a whole bunch of current flows down the wire. When it hits the Y, the current gets split, but also something looks like it reflects back towards the battery. That's kind of weird. Okay, at that point I stopped the video and replied back. Now I'm at 11 minutes and 10 seconds. I forgot to take into account that the connection at the Y would also cause a reflection. And now we have a pulse, actually two identical pulses, traveling down both far wires. Remember, this wire has the ends disconnected and this wire has the ends soldered together. When the two identical pulses reach the end of their respective wires, the one that meets a disconnected circuit slams into a wall. All of that current sloshes back and piles up. The other pulse gets shorted out, drops to zero, and also sends that information back towards the battery. If I speed up here, we see over a few reflections, the battery realizes it tried to send way too much power the first time, and slowly the whole circuit settles down. Current, the actual flow of electrons, ends up following this slope as the high voltage at the battery drops to nothing at the short, and in the disconnected wire, where nothing should be happening, there isn't a slope, no voltage to make electrons move. Until the waves actually get to the ends of the wire, they look identical. Because these waves of current don't know what is at the end of their respective branches of the circuit. Once they realize what's at the end of their circuit, they transmit that information back to the battery. This branch says, whoa, I need a bit less current this way, it looks like a wall. And this one says, hey, I need more current, make this hill a little bit steeper. When both these signals meet each other and eventually get back to the battery, there's a negotiation and it requires a lot of back and forth communication. In this case, the whole circuit took about 4,000 nanoseconds to stabilize. That's like eight round trips. 
I also want to point out that these wires can't talk to each other through this gap. I just wanted to make it easy to compare the waves by putting them side by side. So for those of you keeping score at home, the answer is C. It takes much longer than one round trip for electricity for the current to stabilize and for the circuit to obey Ohm's law in DC. Well, he says the answer is C. I initially said it was D, but you can probably see why I answered that way. And so then I finally responded, well, C isn't really correct. The battery doesn't guess. The initial pulse of current is due to the capacitive and inductive coupling between the wires. It's no guess. So how did I make such an accurate guess of what was going to happen? Well, it's just a rudimentary understanding of how capacitors, inductors, and transmission lines work. So these two wires, I'll just draw them as parallel wires. Let's draw the whole nine yards here. There's the shorted, there's the open ones, and then the battery is going to be at this end over here. I'll just draw a couple of little dots there to represent that. And so what we have is a transmission line. We have two parallel conductors. What happens when you have two conductors separated by an insulator? You have a capacitor, because that's exactly what a capacitor is. So when we connect this battery across this capacitor, what's the capacitor going to do? When you first energize a capacitor, it looks like a short circuit. It looks like current goes right through it. Of course, charges pile up on one side and are pushed away from the other, and eventually it settles down to whatever voltage we had here, but at first current will go through. And of course, nothing happens instantly. The current will first start flowing here, then there, then there, then there, and this wave is going to travel down at the velocity factor of the cables. And I had heard somewhere that Ethernet cables, which are twisted pairs, had a velocity factor of 50. That might have been a generalization. He said that the wave went down at about 60% of the speed of light. So that means these wires had a velocity factor of 60. So I was pretty close. And when we get to this point here, there's a change in impedance because of the splitting. And whenever you have a change of impedance in a transmission line, you're going to get a reflection. So I forgot to account for that. And so there's a little bit of reflection there, so it reflects back. And because that battery impedance doesn't match the line impedance here, we're going to get a reflection back there too, which we've already seen a little bit of. So the waves are going to continue out this way and continue out that way, and they have no way of knowing what's going on at the end. They're just going through identical wires. So as the video showed, we get two identical waves going out there. Here, everything piles up. It's like hitting a brick wall, so it piles up and then reflects back. Here, it's like going over the edge of a cliff, but even that, we have that drop goes back as a wave. So we see a positive wave go here and a negative wave there, and they both go back. And then we get a reflection back here and back there. They go through, they reflect back, and get, in the end up with a very complex number of reflections going back and forth between here and there and there and back and forth between there and there. Quite a bit of complex reflections that you could see, but eventually it settled down to where we had the voltage. Let's say that was a 9 volt battery. The voltage all the way out here settled out to 9 volts. And then the voltage out here settled down to where if we had a voltmeter here, we would see 0 volts because there's a short there. But then there's a certain amount. I drew that wrong, didn't I? Eh, well, whatever. There's a certain amount of resistance in the wire, and that's going to determine how much current we actually have flowing through there. And so it settled down just as I said. We ended up with a current determined by Ohm's law flowing through here, and then the voltage up there was the same. So I'm not an expert in radio and transmission lines. I know just enough about them to have made this accurate guess. And of course, rudimentary knowledge of capacitors means there's going to be some current immediately because a capacitor acts like a short circuit when you first energize it. These wires, even though they, well, they were twisted, so it was a little bit of coiling, but even though they're basically straight wires, even a straight wire has inductance. So that wire is going to resist the current at first, but that's also going to create a magnetic field, which is going to couple across to the other wire, which is going to cause current to flow the opposite direction. So just as the capacitor was a short circuit from one to the other, these acted like a transformer from one to the other. So we get current from both the transformer action and from the capacitor action. And once it all settled down, it was just a DC circuit, so the inductance didn't make any difference. The capacitance is just two conductors separated by an insulator, so the voltage is the same all the way down. So if you looked at it, we have a voltage that's dropping, 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 dropping to here. 
it stays at that voltage all the way to these open wires, but then continues to drop down to zero at that point once everything settles down. So that was a very, very good video. I, I like what he did. Um, a lot of work. I'm not sure I would have thought of doing all of that, but he demonstrated something that I already knew the answer to, but showed it in a real and a graphic way that demonstrates why these things happen. So my hat's off to Alpha Phoenix for making that video. So everybody go there and watch it. He's got a good channel. So if you think this was an interesting and informative way to analyze what his video showed, give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the gray bell when you do so you get notified when I put up new videos. And if you want to learn electronics technology, perhaps become a certified electronics technician, or get a jump start in your studies in electrical engineering, you can take my free course at vocademy.net. To help me put these videos up and to keep Vocademy free, you can go to patreon.com slash vocademy and pledge your support or look down below for a link to make a one-time donation. A big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I couldn't do this without you, and thanks to everyone for watching.